uh, let me just do a couple other quick things. And then we'll get started. Can everybody hear me? I guess I disabled chat, so you can't hear me. So we'll start off with, uh, you know, when I used to play in orchestras, we used to schedule a an initial uh, short piece, you know, like five minute piece to play. So latecomers would, uh, People have like a little applause, audience applause to like get to their seats in time. So I came up with just a little thing I thought I would share uh, from an email with some of my friends that is kind of relevant to, um, you know, what's currently going on with coronavirus uh, because we were talking about, I'm a lawyer, right? We're talking about um, in the Japanese culture, they have what are called seals or chops. And just every single time that anybody ever sees something, then they uh, they have to stamp their own personal seal on on the document, and it's just a sign that they have seen the particular document and they approve of it. Uh, and it often replaces a signature, and it, so it shows you know everybody has these physical like little stamps that they have to use on the documents that they do, uh, and it's kind of wreaking havoc with their desire to stay home and telecommute because it's such a paper culture. Everything is facts and actual paper copies in order to do these physical stamps that people who are normally able to uh, telecommute, you know, they're able to do all of their job except for these little chops, these little stamps that they have. And then they have to go into the office every few days to just like do a bunch of chops, you know, like they've already read the documents, but then they're like stamp, 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 just a bunch of stamps, you know, a hundred stamps, and then they'll be able to go home. So every few days they have to make the journey into the office to just do these stamps. And uh, so the, here's kind of like what I, I wrote them. I said, it's so interesting how much more tied to paper they are than we are in our economic, I guess, you know, I'm thinking United States centric. And I said, I've been thinking about this a lot, how we're sort of seeing the evolutionary interaction of diversity and evolutionary selective advantage in a sped up way. So, you know, I guess a selective evolutionary advantage would be like if you have camouflage, you know, camouflage for a particular desert environment, then you would probably like have an evolutionary advantage to be able to survive better than someone who doesn't have camouflage for that particular environment. So we're seeing this kind of evolutionary selection happening. I said there is a great uh, carne asada place down the street from me, but it doesn't have a drive through. Uh, that place is empty compared to a mediocre place a few blocks away that does have a drive through I saw an interesting post about how the technologies of 2012 are making a huge comeback in the era of SARS-CoV-2, including MOOCs. Man, what are they called? It's short for multi-online something classrooms, right? So these big like uh, online classrooms, uh, video conferencing, which we're doing currently, and some of these other optimizing tools like Slack. Maybe you have people who have gotten you into Slack uh, using it as a, a messaging uh, service between office coworkers. So even the Zoom CEO said he was so surprised at the company's success. Federalism is also making a huge comeback, at least in the United States. We used to be really big on having stuff be mostly the federal government. And now we're like states should be able to choose for their own selves about stuff. So that's federalism is making a big comeback. People who have been trying to simplify and optimize for years to the best and most popular are relearning the value of ordering from REI instead of Amazon, right? Because that's what they suggested to me is Amazon has like a month uh, long wait for getting stuff shipped, at least where I am. But if you order it from the stores themselves, it's, a, it's only like five days. Uh, so normally Amazon's more convenient, but actually it's more convenient to order it straight from the stores right now. And introverts have the adaptive advantage for the first time in a long time. Even as we are becoming more homogenous in certain things, there is an odd strength to be found in our disunity. I'm always so happy for the opportunity I have every day to see these things a little differently. So I think I was kind of thinking about that, about how this is kind of a good argument for, it's a good argument for uh, neurodiversity because here we have, you know, a situation where you know, there's just the, we don't know what's going to happen right there. It could be, as I said before, introverts have the advantage over extroverts. Extroverts are probably suffering much more than they would otherwise in a, a normal environment and vice versa. You know, like people who make a really good face-to-face -face impression, 
they don't have the advantage anymore uh, because things are happening not face to face hardly as much anymore. So I, I just thought it was interesting as people kind of talk about like we're we're all in this together and one world and all this. Like the the thing that actually has been really helpful is for everybody to be different because people have different strengths, different advantages uh, that are being asked, you know, called upon. Uh, in ways that we didn't anticipate. Like we used to, I mean, I used to think, okay, my postman, he's pretty good or whatever, but I didn't think, you know, that I needed him, you know, like it was like a life or death situation. Like he was an essential person uh, or performed an essential function in my life, but now maybe he does, you know, and a lot of other people, school teachers, grocery store workers, uh, these various people who maybe we uh, didn't appreciate so much the role that they played and I, I think that's an interesting thing that has happened uh, recently is that we are starting to appreciate that diversity actually makes us stronger and I guess even more so than unity makes us stronger. So I do have a guest. Uh, I think he muted himself so we would need uh, to get him unmuted. Jack M unmuted if we can. Let's see if we can't do that then maybe I can help oh there we go okay so uh, Jack do you want to kind of uh, tell us a little bit about yourself maybe start um, you can either start in childhood or start when you first found out that maybe there was like this word sociopath or psychopath that applied to you Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I was diagnosed with uh, antisocial personality disorder when I was 22, which is kind of late by most people's standards. And before that, um, I was diagnosed with ADHD at 16, which is much, much later than um, most most males because they get diagnosed kind of when they were when they're kids. <clears throat> and um, Although, although that um, when I was first diagnosed with ADHD, that did shine a bit of light on my misbehaviors, if you want to call them. Um, it really did not explain um, the kind of behavior that I was um, that I was performing both in my social life and at school and at home. Um, and finally, when I was 22 and I got diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, it really kind of opened the world up in terms of explaining different things and allowed me to um, kind of dissect a lot of my childhood, my teenage years, my university years. Um, to give some context, I'm 27 now. Um, and um, yeah, it was actually, the diagnosis itself obviously was a bit of a shock because um, most portrayals of people with uh, any social personality disorder or sociopaths in general get a pretty bum rap. So um, it was a shock to definitely my family and whoever I discussed it with. But for me, it was like a massive eye-opening experience. That's something that I could now now use to, I guess, explain and, and also predict future behaviours that I might do or certain reactions that I might have to particular things that are going on in my life. So yeah, that's probably a little bit of background about myself. Uh, here, just one second. So can you tell, uh, so it sounds like there are kind of three things, you know, what led up to the diagnosis? What was the behaviors that led up to the diagnosis? Uh, and then the second thing was, you know, what was the immediate effect, I guess, that the diagnosis had on your life? And then this third idea of like, now does it kind of, how does it help you or hurt you to conceive of your life and your previous behaviors or your current behaviors in terms of the diagnosis? Sure. Um, so I definitely started out when I was in primary school. So that's um, primary school is kids from years, uh, six years old up to 12. And when I was in year six, which is roughly 11 or 12 years old, um, they did this survey with, regarding uh, kids that were bullies and they were trying to find out who was the biggest bully in the, in the school um, and not to expel them, but to counsel them to obviously try and make them stop. Um, I ranked up there as number one. Now, 
that came as a huge shock to me because the way that I perceived myself as behaving was normal. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I didn't think I was hurting anybody. It was a complete mystery to me. So, of course, I didn't understand the concept of being any social at that time. So that then progressed. That was, a, sorry, that was a huge eye opener for me. And, I, and then that was when I started asking questions, you know, at a younger age being like, oh, this is weird. And then later on, they, because um, I was still quite troublesome at school, I wasn't, I wasn't a bad student, like by any stretch of the imagination. I just really enjoyed, you know, getting into trouble, getting into fights, you know, um, you know, very reckless, impulsive behavior. Um, and then they obviously, like they do with most boys, uh, tagged me with ADHD, which actually getting diagnosed with that did help a little bit, especially with my studies. Um, Continuing through to my secondary school um, and into university, there was that same kind of mystery that happened when I was in primary school. So there was this, um, you know, const constant wanting to like cause disruptions and not really registering that it had an impact on other individuals around me. So, um, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed getting into physical altercations, although... <laughs> It wasn't to hurt the other person, but at the same time, like it was enjoyable for me to get hurt. And what I mean by that, it was, it was nice knowing that I wasn't made of glass and that, you know, I kind of had this control over when I wanted to, uh, you know, gain a rush of adrenaline or if I wanted to assert myself or, you know, and then it went even further into more mental manipulation where it was, I would start arguments with other people I would manipulate them in social situations of things of if I wanted something from them um, you know usually the opposite sex um, and I would do it purely for the for the for the love of the game if you want to call it like that for the, the love of the hunt um, and that started to snowball quite um, it the behavior became more noticeable among my friends my family and again I didn't see an issue with it I was studying, I was healthy, like I thought I was doing everything fine. I still had good relationships with everything, but they were obviously picking things up. So I got sent to a psychiatrist and he did about a couple months worth of reviewing and gave me the diagnosis. So um, yeah, that was kind of the progression that led up to it. Um, sorry, so what was the um, second and third part? <clears throat> So how did you, um, the second part was like, what was the media effect of the diagnosis? So how did you, how were you told about the diagnosis and did it have like any immediate effect on your life? Sure. So, so you first, usually it started off, or sorry, initially it was like, oh, he's just a narcissist. Like all he cares about is himself. Um, you know, he's got this massive inflated ego and this superiority complex. But it just wasn't explaining the like super erratic impulsive behavior um, and it wasn't explaining the um, I guess the the forced altercations that I was putting on myself. Another one was like uh, relationship sabotage. If I saw a relationship well, in my perspective getting boring, you know, I would just sabotage it and watch it explode. And that was a lot of fun. Um, so the initial the initial diagnosis, I was just like, whoa, like antisocial personality disorder. Like, I swear to God, I see these guys in video games and movies and books and they're always the bad guys. Like, am I the bad guy? Like, I didn't, I didn't think I was the bad guy. So um, initially it was a shock because there are just so much stigma tied, tied onto the word and tied onto the diagnosis itself. Um, but I had a really, really good psychiatrist and he was actually super helpful in... Um, deconstructing some of the um, information and some of the, um, I guess, definitions or, or explanations around the, my behavior. So the, the initial was definitely a shock for everybody around me, including myself. Um, but immediately following that, it opened up a lot of doors. Um, it was like, it made, it, it, it wouldn't say that it made me be able to control myself more but it was more like I could predict what I was going to do or how it might influence other people like it was it was you know finally giving me a solid foundation 
for my behavior that I'd never had before. So um, I didn't see it much as a hindrance, as more of a, as a tool that I could use to explain things both to myself and to others around me. I wouldn't say that it stifled the behavior too much. There was definitely an improvement if you want to look at it from a moral perspective, but um, it was definitely uh, like a, a really, really good platform that I could finally start organizing things in my life and um, yeah, move, move, moving forward from there. So uh, I wonder like uh, what might be an example of like something where like, can you think of a concrete story or a concrete example of you being like, okay, now I, I understand this better. And so you, your self conceptualization changed sure. and maybe your behavior changed as a result. Sure. So um, one of the big things for me was definitely physical altercations. Um, and when I turned 20, I started boxing um, and, you know, I was going there and it's, it's, I was, I, you know, I've been doing it now for almost six years and, um, you know, I was, I was going there and, and, and I was just absolutely exhilarated by the thought of, of potentially, you know, hurting somebody or or being hurt, but in a way that was completely legal and not in, in a way that was completely controlled and in a way that didn't have any moral moral implications and seemed to have fit perfectly into what I what I perceived as as a as a, an activity that really scratched that itch in terms of wanting to um, I guess use other individuals for my own gain and a good example of that is I, I would spar with other people and I didn't necessarily because you know inspiring like I didn't necessarily wanted to hurt them but I didn't care if I did and then also I think there was a distinction between intent and outcome like I didn't want to hurt them but the result was was that I when I did and I knew that they could be hurt and I could be hurt and that I was potentially better than them I would continue to do so. If they went down, I would be the first person to pick them back up again, but purely just so I could start punching them again. So there, I think, and this, I think might, might be a trait that's a little bit more um, male centric mm -hmm. um, when it comes to like physical competition or physical um, altercation. That was, um, that for me, it was manipulating the boxing club in a way that, that suited my needs best. And, and um, manipulating fighters that weren't as good as me and, you know, really um, like feeding that, you know, the, the, the need for, I guess, yeah, I, I guess it's, you know, some kind, of, some kind of like rush in terms of like this physical so social interaction that I wasn't really, well, I couldn't get legally anywhere else. So that was... That was probably one, and it's something that has obviously gotten better. I'm not going out punching people in the street. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we've all, we've all got mouth guards and gloves on and stuff like that. But it, it for from from a male perspective, with somebody with you know antisocial tendencies, it's like the perfect environment to be in. <laughs> yes, you know, and I should tell people I I disabled the chat. I I'll try to enable it next time. I think I accidentally disabled it. But if you have a question, feel free to just email me at uh, me at sociopathworld.com or maybe I'll try to check my Twitters too. I'll try to triple task this. But you, uh, I agree about the physicality and I think that, I think it is a male thing, but I think it's also like a human thing that maybe we have kind of uh, like a, a childish thing actually. Like I was just talking to, uh, I was just talking to Aria about how my little toddler nephew likes to be choked. And she said, <laughs> she said, don't, don't mention that to anybody, but I feel like we can mention it here because it's a safe space, but I don't choke. I don't like impact his, uh, what do we say? His uh, larynx. Maybe I impact that. I don't, I don't actually like uh, impact his ability to breathe, whatever that is. Oh, but I just yeah. kind of grab him by the neck and shake him a little bit. And he kind of likes it. You know, he, he like laughs when you do it. And I think babies like that sort of physicality. In fact, uh, uh, his parents sent a video to like the family chat recently where they're kind of like roughhousing him. And then he kind of leans backwards. He's leaning backwards and his mom was like, oh, you want to be turned upside down. And you tur she turns him upside down and he's like laughing. He like loves it. And he's like shaking his own self, you know, 
there's just like a, I think a physicality um, that I think, I, I think maybe normal people replace it with like physical affection or yeah. like hugs. And uh, I think though, like for, I, I get it, you know, I also like to feel my physical limitations. I, uh, I like to kind of keep going. I, you know, so people used to, this used to be a bigger thing, I guess. I'm starting to get older, right? So maybe I do it less frequently, but I, you know, people would be like, well, wouldn't you be upset if somebody hit you? And I was like, eh. I mean, not <laughs> as much as you might think actually, because if I got hit, you know, there's a certain pleasure to that too, to getting hit, right? Would you agree oh, with absolutely. that too? Yeah. So, um, trust me, like, especially when you're sparring or if you're actually in a fight, like, there is nothing that gives you more of an exhilaration. Like, sure, punching the other person's fine, but when you get hit, like, a switch flicks and it goes, like, you're in a fight. And especially when you've got antisocial tendencies, it's literally like uncaging a beast. Like, it's just like, go do whatever you want. Go nuts. Like, it's it's game on. So it's a very fast and loose way of, um, I guess, yeah, feeding, feeding that desire or, um, yeah, getting that feeling that you, you, you sometimes crave. So I wonder, would you agree with this? I, I think that it would extend to non-physical things too. Like if I'm in mm -hmm. any sort of what you said, I think you said earlier, you're playing the game or whatever, right? Yeah. Would you say that you, you don't mind getting like beat in a game either? Because I don't mind it. Like if somebody seduces me, I'm like, okay, you know, like I, I don't, it's like, to me, it's the equivalent of getting hit. It, it doesn't matter who's the one getting hit or doing the hitting. I just kind of like the engagement, the interaction with the person. Absolutely. And I definitely want to like, the only reason why I brought up the physicality part, because I guess it resonates more with me, but there is definitely a lot of mental conflict or mental, if you want to call it, you know, mentally trading blows with other people and like you said playing games and um yeah lo losing losing a game or an argument of the debate or, or or something of that nature is insanely frustrating but not for the fact that i've lost it it's more that why don't i know or have that tool that the other person has that i can use against right. them or against other people so it's more yeah it's more of a very very self-centered um, not that I can learn from this. It's like, like, can you teach me? <laughs> yes. And you know what? I think when people design video games, it's, it's like that. You want it to be not so easy. Like it, the point is not to just win. The point is the challenge. The point is the engagement. The point is yeah. feeling like you're learning and growing from the interaction with the person. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, I mean, another factor to that is a lot of the times, well, I can't speak for everybody, but for me, I don't pick fights that I'm going to lose. So, but when I do pick a fight and I, well, mentally, when I do, you know, have a debate or an argument and I do lose said debate or argument, it's, 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 it's double as bad. You know, I've picked it expecting to win and I don't have the tools to, you know, effectively get what I want out of the other person. So now I've got to, go against every fiber of my being of asking them to help <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting so um yeah i this is this is interesting this this idea of engagement uh, with people and i wonder if we do seek this kind of engagement like maybe the gamesmanship to us really is a substitute for the for the normal sorts of interactions people would have emotional interactions like the intimacy the emotional bonding that they would have like for us we, we still like i at least feel a drive to still interact with people you know i still want to interact with people like uh, some somebody asked ahead of time how we're dealing with uh coronavirus isolation and i i do miss people you know i it's not like i'm like oh i'm a robot i don't need people like i like interacting with people i like engaging with them and i think especially before i became kind of more mo emotionally like in touch with my emotions emotionally self-aware I think that, um, yeah, gamesmanship was the way that I kind of, uh, that's how I related to people. That's how I understood who I was, even in the world, is to see my impact in the other person. You know, like, how did I know that I existed in a way was, you know, somebody reacted to me. That's, that was like, uh, kind of essential to my own self-conception. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's it can be really it can be kind of crucial um, and at the same time difficult for for me to kind of self assess um, in in regards to like or even assess how the other person might feel. So um, for me personally, like I I can't get enough of interacting with other people because I see every single time an interaction as an opportunity. And although I'm talking very much to the nth degree of maybe antisocial behavior, um, you know, every interaction that I have, whether it be positive or negative, and I'd like to think the majority of them are positive is an opportunity to learn something and to learn something from them, from another person. And like, I, I don't like, I, I don't think I could, you know, not do that for an extended period of time. Like I have to be constantly, for me, I have to be constantly doing that. And um, a lot of the time I do forget, or I, it's not that I forget, I just ignore how the other person might feel from those. But um, I think, like you said, like self-assessment or the fact that people are willing to engage with you definitely gives like this, like you said, you know, oh, I exist, you know, people around me, react and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a big part of um, how I socialize. You know, speaking about this, it actually makes me think a little bit of ADHD because isn't the idea you said earlier that you in the classroom would kind of cause a commotion or whatever, you were just kind of being disruptive. And what do you think uh, was the motivation for you being disruptive? Um, it was, it was a hundred percent self-centered. Like there's like, I definitely, I definitely wanted to have, have the attention of others mm -hmm. and I definitely wanted to have the attention of the teacher. And I guess there was that like, you know, oh, the, you know, the teacher is paying attention to all these other students. I just want him to pay attention to me. Right. Um, and it's funny though, because even with having ADHD, like my, my marks, my performance at school were, were great there was there was no issue there it was purely like a behavioral aspect and a, and a social aspect and it was just like you know i can't i can't deal with you know I, I can't deal with all these people you know not you know only having the t like they're all got the teacher's attention i don't have it i want it what's the best way to get it you know, throw a rock at the window or something along those lines, you know, throw a book on the ground. So, yeah, I think that was where it was more focused. And again, that's why the ADHD didn't exactly explain the behavior. Like, yeah, you're disruptive, you're, you're not attentive, but it shouldn't be producing these kind of results. And to dig just like one step a little bit deeper. So you wanted the attention, but what was it about the attention that seemed so appealing to you? That was a good question because at the time, because I was younger, um, I didn't really know. And it wasn't until I was later diagnosed, it was like, oh, okay, like I run, you know, if you want to think of it like a fuel tank, I kind of run off this need to have, to be socially disruptive or socially manipulative and having that power to do so is fairly rewarding in a way. and. It's funny now that I look back at it, I wish I hadn't been that disruptive. I mean, I don't like, you know, I don't really mind too much. It's not like I hurt anybody, but you know, I, you know, I wish I could have done things a little bit more differently, but it was, it was, it wasn't until I was diagnosed that I was looking back for it. I was like, Oh, okay. Like I know why I needed that. Like I needed to fill my fuel tank up because I wasn't getting enough of it elsewhere. So the, the classroom was like a perfect situation for that behavior to actually take place. Yeah, kind of perfect in a way, too, because you were so restricted in other ways, right? Like, I have a nephew that probably is on the autism spectrum, probably has autism spectrum disorder, has not been officially diagnosed, but he white knuckles it during school because it it's like everything has to be just so. And the really interesting thing about him is that he has a hard time, especially with kind of these soft rules. The explicit rules are okay. He understands those. He feels like he can learn them and he can adhere to them. He can abide by them. But it's these soft kind of social expectations that really kind of cause him problems. He does not like getting in trouble and he especially does not like getting in trouble. Like I, I think he actually doesn't mind getting in trouble. It's when he gets in trouble for something that he didn't anticipate. 
you know, like if he knew there was a rule against, you know, don't, don't like, I don't know, don't take two milks or something. And he took two milks. Mm -hmm. He would understand, you know, he would be like, okay, there was a rule and I broke the rule and I deserve the punishment kind of like, he doesn't get upset by that, but he gets really triggered when he breaks kind of one of these soft rules. And then people are kind of like, you knew better than that, you know, kind of try to like shame him a little bit. And then he, he cannot stand that. That is like so terrible for him that he like is almost uh, like self-censoring in school. You can tell that yeah. he comes home and he's exhausted from having to kind of uh, regulate his behavior in all these ways that people don't really think that they're forcing him to do, but they are. Do you feel like that was kind of true of you too? Yeah, I mean, again, it came down to the part where I was kind of like, the I understood the rules, but I didn't really care that they were there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And and it was more because I wasn't aware of my behavior until my diagnosis that, as I said before, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. It's like, yeah, right, you're not supposed to run in the hallway. You're not supposed to um, you know, swear at the teacher and you're not supposed to do this and not supposed to do that. But I was like, I was like, well, what's, what's going to happen if I do like, what are they going to kick me out of school? Or are they going to just go to another school? Like, right. It, it, it just like, it didn't, it, there was never enough weight behind the consequences to make me not do it that way. And again, it was, I was, all, I was suspended twice. One of them was for lying, um, which, which was quite a, w w there was a lot of context behind it, but primarily it was just due to lying. And the other one was um, trying to manipulate one of the teachers to, or to give me better grades on a test. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that I was doing that was explaining that I had all these like problems at home and yada, yada, yada. And, and basically it was a complete, it was completely made up. And I, she gave them to me initially and then found out that I basically had just fabricated some kind of story. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then I almost got kicked out of school for that as well. But yeah, going back to the rules, um, yeah, I, I just, as I said before, there was, there was nothing, there was nothing strong enough to be like, okay, Jack, don't do this. Like it's, it, yeah, it just, it, it was, it just wasn't registering. It wasn't until I was diagnosed that I was just like, okay, that behavioral amount to that, you should maybe think about doing it a different way. So so this is kind of interesting, and this is something I think that people kind of familiar with the topic have heard before, that it's not the stick, it's the carrot. You know, like if you want a, a sociopath, a psychopath to change their behavior, then you need to use incentives more than the punishment. And this is yeah. true of my, uh, my experience, and I think it's, it's basically true of everybody that I've talked to who kind of identifies as either been diagnosed or self-identifies as being sociopathic that it's, it's almost as if the punishment like does not register in your brain as being a bad thing. Like in the moment, yes, but it's like the memory, it's like the memory gets miscatalogued somewhere. Like you never become fearful because of it. Like, like Aria, for instance, she would touch a hot stove multiple times and it's like never would the, you know, and we're, we're supposed to have like these uh, sorts of fears for an evolutionarily like advantaged reason, right? Like if you touch the hot stove, you learn that you're not going to do it, but there's something messed up there that it does not like register as actually like a negative thing. Would you, does that sound like your experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, yeah, it's, it's almost like this really opaque glass plane that you just can't see through. And you know, the, it's, it's kind of like, as you said, there's just like, you can't see that the rules really exist or that they impact you enough. And, and that can not only apply to stuff like school, but just in life. It's just like you said, putting a hand on the hot stove. I mean, I've been in three motor vehicle accidents, which have almost killed me. And as a byproduct of me being just stupid and reckless, but I knew that the consequences, I just didn't care. You know, I've got multiple tattoos, um, some of which are really stupid, but I didn't care. Just go and chuck them on. Why not? Like, and you know, there was a, like, I'd, I'd get a girlfriend and, um, you know, the relationship got boring after you burn it down. I'll find another one. Like it was like, it's there's, you don't really, and don't get me wrong. Like later on there is there, you do get some consequences and they things do weigh down. Like nobody's definitely not immune to these kind of things. They do, they do have their own impact in their own way, but 
yeah, like you said, there's just there's some kind of barrier there that that just doesn't allow you to register. Is this bad? Will it hurt me? Will it help hurt others? Should I not do it? It's yeah, it's just kind of not there. But I will say, as my life has progressed, um, those things have become a lot more clear, and I've actually become, I'd say, more happier as a byproduct of being able to identify them. Well, can you talk a little bit more about that? So, so these these kind of especially early experiences didn't really have that much influence on your behavior. Not getting punished, not any of it. So what, what, what was kind of the change? What was the inflection point? And now how is it like, what, what is it that does motivate you to change your behavior or change your, your life uh, in any particular way? So um, I guess, you know, referencing back to your book, there was, um, you know, there was family and friends, which um, I think when it comes to sociopaths, like the inner circle is so important to the um, to you primarily because um, I guess you understand the significance of them caring about you and the usefulness of you caring about them. So as I as when I when I got diagnosed and after I continued some therapy and um, you know, going to uni, um, I started finding more benefit and more under and the more that I was understanding as a, a from my psychiatrist um, how being more aware of other people yielded better results if I was, say, more like manipulative or antisocial. So I was actually finding this, although, you know, using either one wasn't an issue. It was more like, oh, you know, if I scratch this person's back, they'll scratch mine. Or if I'm a little bit nice, if, you know, if I make my girlfriend a coffee in the morning, she'll sleep with me later in the day. Like, you know, it's so like there was, and, Obviously, there's a level of like self-centeredness behind uh, behind that, but you know, I feel like plenty of people can do good things with their own self-interest at heart. So there was, as as I was getting more more therapy, you know, he was you know ex- he was explaining things to me like, you know, um, you know, in your in your friends group, you know, you can potentially um, instead of you know manipulating your friend to go and buy all the alcohol all the beers and, and you know put the party on yourself maybe you should try holding the party for everybody and you can try cleaning up and and then in the future you'll um you know they'll invite you to more parties and so on and it was and it was like small practices like that that maybe put my put you know put me out a little bit that actually yielded more results and people started to like me more and and you know i'm with a, i'm with a girl now who's absolutely amazing similar to your and in your book (laughs) Uh Um, and and yeah and it's and it's just slowly started yielding some some really wonderful results and you know i'm at this at this stage in my life don't get me wrong i still like uh (laughs) i still like playing my games here and there but um you know i think as i've just grown up and being like you said more emotionally aware and more emotionally aware of others it's um it's kind of opened up a, a, a bigger world and um, had fairly positive results as a byproduct. That's awesome. So I got a little notification that said that uh, Zoom is giving us free minutes. Who knows how much longer than the 40 minutes. So um, I don't know if you have to rush off. Do you have another, what, 10 minutes? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Okay, so you said something kind of earlier I wanted to get back to. Uh, and f- people feel free to, I've seen a couple of emails so far about some commentary about some of the stuff you've said, and, and I'll ask if I can share that with you, uh, yep. but feel free for other people to uh, email me a actual question if you have one for Jack. But you said something earlier, kind of during when you were talking about boxing, about intent versus outcome. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about that or? Absolutely. Elaborate? So, absolutely. So, especially when you're, I mean, there's make no mistake when you're boxing or I should say when you are fighting. So if you're doing an exhibition or an amateur fight or a professional fight, you win by putting the other person on the ground or by let's just call it what it is hurting them. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time when I was sparring in particular, because sparring is simulating that um, I, you, you don't intend on hurting one another. You're simulating the fight environment. So I would go in there and I, had no intention of hurting the person but if i did i didn't care 
And at the same time, if I know that I had, that I could do it again and I could win as a byproduct of keep continuing to do that. So that's what I make this the distinction between intent and outcome and then the feeling that comes as a byproduct of that outcome. So don't want to hurt the guy. I've hurt him. It feels great. Let's keep going. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. So um, yeah, I guess that's what I, that's what I took away from that. And when you do it more and more and more and um, it's, and it's not like a drug or anything like that, but you can def you can definitely get addicted to that feeling and you get to become a better fighter and you fight better opponents and it becomes more rewarding. And, you know, your dopamine and serotonin has gone absolutely crazy. And it's, 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 yeah. So that's the long winded way of answering that. So do you think that there's like a greater application to this concept? Uh, like outside of boxing, for instance, like, or is there ever a situation where you're not intending on hurting a person or achieving a particular outcome? You know, you're, you're just kind of like engaging with the person, interacting, and then the outcome kind of happens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, finding a good example for that outside of the ring for me would be a little bit different, but I guess, yeah. It's a, that's a, that's a, that's a bit of a tough one to answer because a lot of the time I've tied that entire concept into, it's probably happened a lot outside of the ring, but that's probably where I've, where I've tied it into. Um, have you had experiences where I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of times where I've gone into altercations with people with no intent of hurting their feelings and hoping for a positive outcome, yet they've gotten hurt and lo and behold, it did not faze me whatsoever. So um, I'm sure there are people, I guess, who, or maybe even yourself, that could probably answer that better from a social perspective. Yeah, when you said that, I, I did think, you know, I, I've posted before, I don't know if I, it's in the book, but about like accidentally seducing somebody. You know, you're yeah. just engaging them and kind of every conversation, every, like I'm sure this is like not only me, like I'm sure it's like even babies do this, where you're just kind of compelled to kind of smile at somebody who's smiling back at you right? Like it is kind of a manipulation thing, but it's, it's whatever it is, mirror neurons or something that we've been programmed to almost like flirt with people. Like I found myself in a lot of situations, not like intending to flirt with somebody, but just kind of like matching their energy, you know, matching their vibe. Yeah. And then if, if you kind of just keep engaging with certain people about stuff, like I've had like all sorts of situations where people are like, you know, I thought you were really interested in me. And I was like, I was just being nice. I was just being friendly. You know, I just thought it might be nice to have lunch or whatever when they're like kind of picking up on all these uh, kind of like secret messages. So, and I also think there's maybe like a little bit, but feel free to disagree. Uh, sure. you, you or other people, I think there's a little bit of an application to kind of when people say, why do sociopaths, psychopaths, why do they do bad things? You know, and I think there too, there's kind of like an intent outcome. Like often, you're not actually intending to hurt the person. Like, I, I think there's actually very little maliciousness behind uh, people's actions. Would you say that's true of your own actions, that they're very uh, rarely malicious? I would say, I would say it's, more, it's more true in my social interactions than it is, because I, I, I need to have a level of mal maliciousness to be able to bolt effectively <laughs> right so i would say it's it's a lot truer it's a lot truer of my social interactions um than it is um, more in my in my physical ones um yeah I, yeah that's probably the if i can agree with you on that one and then somebody had a question about your professional life so uh feel free to either dis disclose as much as you want but would you say in your professional life that there have been situations where you know, you, you've been aggressive in a way that maybe could be read as being overly aggressive for the situation, but you thought this is just what it means to be in this particular profession? Sure. Um, so, I, so, yeah, so at uni I did, um, I did a Bachelor of Commerce and Business Administration, and then I decided I didn't want to do that and moved into doing an honours and a master's class in, um, in organisational psychology, which, considering my diagnosis was very handy right so um on my professional life I, I work for quite a large um construction organization in, in australia and um, i moved into the hr space which 
is a really, really strange place for a sociopath to go. So um, my understanding was it was like, I want to be around as many people as I possibly can, especially ones that care so much about the, like the social aspects of an organization, you know, mm. um, ensuring like office fairness and diversity and, um, you know, contracting, so on and so forth. Um, I definitely, I'm definitely not an aggressive person when it comes to my professional and social life because it would just get me fired. Like there's, there's, there's that whole, um, co you know, benefit cost and all analysis that goes on. Um, I definitely see myself more seeing it as like a chessboard. So if I can get one of my, uh, one of my associates or one of my managers to, see things in a perspective that I want to see so that it benefits me. Maybe I'll get a promotion out of it, a couple extra days leave, maybe I'll win a project. Um, I'll, do, I'll go and do that. But it might be at the detriment of other people in my team. Like uh, another person that I know, you know, may have missed out on their holiday because I've chosen to go and do my holiday, but I don't, that doesn't, that's just worked out great for me. So um, I think it's definitely made me, when it comes to more of the, um, mechanical and the practical side of my professional life it's made it super effective because i could pretty much just block out anything whenever i choose to and 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 dial in but at the same time due to the profession that i'm in it's super beneficial because i get to socialize with tons of people and learn a lot of different things and there's many many opportunities to play games but i would never ever um i would never ever call it aggressive behavior um it's definitely a lot more subtle than that Interesting. So would you say like professionally overall, uh, who you are is an advantage uh, in your professional life or a disadvantage? Um, well, in my profession, it's, uh, it's definitely more of a disadvantage because you need to have a higher level of emotional intelligence to be relatively good um, in a practical psychology or human resource way. So um, you need to be quite aware of the others around you um, and what their needs are and what the needs of the organization are and to, um, to, to function effectively. But I guess I've chosen to take that on because, you know, I guess it's more of a challenge. And as I said, I get to interact with more, pe more people. Um, and maybe it sorry. is, it is more easy for you because it's difficult. Yeah, probably. I knew it was because it was like the total opposite of what I should be doing, considering all factors considered. Like if I continued along the path of commerce and business administration, I'm sure I could have just worked with numbers and seen people as assets and gotten a massive kick out of it all day, every day. But it was boring as bad shit. And I just didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to do it. So you know, as I said, I went into my master's program and did psychology and then started working in HR. And I was just like, well, great. This, this, this suits me perfectly. I can, I've, it's like, you know, being a kid in a candy store. <laughs> right. You know, I did a kind of a similar thing. I, I was bad at music, but really good at academic subjects. But when I went to university, I ended up studying music because I was like, well, you know, it, there, there's something about the challenge there that appealed to me. I wanted to kind of conquer it. You know, I got into it a little bit late in high school, getting more and more interested in, and then just thought, you know, this is maybe what I want to do. So that's that's interesting that about the challenge. So two two kind of last questions, uh, and then I'll wrap things up. So uh, do you have one kind of more specific, and I guess one more open-ended? Uh, yep. First one, would you... You know, you sound like a pretty successful psychopath, so successful antisocial <laughs> personality disorder guy. What sort of advice would you give to people who have to interact? Uh, they either are a psychopath or they have to interact with psychopaths in order to kind of help achieve a more successful outcome. Sure. Um, well, I have to say, and I guess I was quite, I was quite lucky. Um, I'll answer it in two ways. First one being from the clinical perspective, um, I was quite lucky to have access to an absolutely fantastic clinician um, who really guided me through, um, I guess, he wasn't trying to change me, which I feel like most of them do. Mm -hmm. He was more like, here's the best path and here's how you can walk it. So I would say 
if you have access to somebody and don't ever settle for the first person you ever sit down with, there is, it is so beneficial to get somebody who is smarter than you and admitting that's probably the first part. Um, and, um, who has studied these things for, you know, 10 plus years that can help you, um, help you maneuver, I guess the moral and emotional landscape that is your life. Um, the second part, I guess, would be moving away from the clinician. N realize that you're not inherently a bad person. That's the first thing that um, that's the first thing that I took on when I got my diagnosis. It's like, oh, well, does this mean I'm just a blanket bad person? No, not at all. You, uh, you need to understand that you're incredibly capable of doing some amazing things. Um, a lot of the time, for me, it was you know being able to volunteer with kids that were very similar to, to myself. Or, um, you know, genuinely looking after my friends and my family or, um, you know, teaching other boxers how to box and stuff like that. So you, there, you, you're still a human being like you and you need to understand that you just because this you, you have this either filter or non filter, it doesn't it doesn't define who you are. And you have absolute agency to, I guess make make decisions that'll benefit you in the best way so i think the worst thing that can can any any person with this diagnosis is think i'm bad i have to be bad that's the that's the be all and end of it so yeah you just need to you need to get rid of that one real quick <laughs> that's awesome and then uh i was going to ask you like a more broad open-ended question is there anything else that i haven't asked you that you think is like really important for people to understand about you or about people with the diagnosis? Um, yeah, I, I guess, <sighs> Jeez, covered a lot. Um, I guess I, I think for me is that if you, if, if you have a good relationship with your friends and family, um, and if you can find a partner for, for instance, my partner's well aware that I'm a sociopath, um, and she's been nothing but so incredibly supportive and has almost been my guide to, <laughs> to, to the world in regards to like, um, you know, when I, when I might come up with rash or impulsive ideas, she'll always be like, Oh, you know, have you thought about this and I thought about that? And I was like, Oh, I haven't actually, that would probably work out a lot better. So she's absolutely amazing um and it's just i guess you keep your keep your friends and your family around them lean on them when you have to help them out when you can because those are the people when things may or may not go wrong are going to be there for you in in the long run and i can't be understated enough and it's not a cliche in any way it really does help because there's so many times when all the people that are so close to me now could have just walked out and said this is just not worth it and have stuck around and it's one of the reasons why I've been able to really take advantage of this and shine it more in a positive way in regards to my social relationship business personal life so if there are people that are important to you around and that are around you keep them there and put in the work to do so everybody else you, you can maybe consider them free game <laughs> <laughs> okay sounds awesome all right with that that, that's great. Thank you so much, Jackie. It's been awesome talking with you and maybe we'll have you on in a, a later episode. Uh, maybe we'll have you as a panelist, a multi-panelist on a later episode, but it's been great talking with you. We really appreciate your insights and thank you everybody who showed up and uh, everybody have a good evening or a good morning, whatever your time is. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was absolutely wonderful. I hope, you can, I hope I can speak to you again soon.